Within most developed countries, notions of pragmatism, notions of the fact that we have democracies, have succeeded in tempering the market economy. In the 19th century, 18th century, the Industrial Revolution has a very negative effect on people, particularly working, classes all over the world. We see data where life expectancy was reduced, hikes we were reduced, we were looking at the medical record. We can see that actually living standards, much among large fractions of population, actually went down. But eventually, we passed the legislation about working conditions. And eventually, we circumscribed some of the worst kinds of behavior. We eventually, in the 20th century, we put regulations that composed better environmental conditions. And so some of the damage was reversed, and that we have made the market economy work in ways that the benefits of the all is far more what we shared in the world a hundred years ago. The debt today is so high, it's 200,000 rupees, 300,000 rupees, of peasants who have no capital. They who know within a year or two when they accumulate that kind of debt. Where is the debt coming from? It's coming from a seed that is costing a 100,000 to 200,000 rupees per kilogram, depending on what you got. Seeds that used to be free used to be theirs. Pesticides each time, the more they use, the more they have to use, 12 sprays, 15 sprays, 20 sprays. Pesticides used in just the last five years in the land areas of India has shown up by 2,000%. That's why the free market and globalization have brought and since we are talking about peasants who have no money, who have no capital, they can only buy expensive seeds and expensive pesticides by borrowing. And who lend that money? The seed companies that sell the pesticides, which are the same companies that sell the seeds, as you know, are now also the major creditors. Globalization, what is globalization? I think that it takes on a few different definitions in one sense of the word. Globalization means proliferation of transactions across country. So, one way of thinking about globalization is a way to describe increased international communications, more trade happening between countries, and be less self-sufficient in providing goods and services to their people and more companies that have offices in multiple countries, which we call multinationals. So, the source of growth in travel and communication and corporate trade across borders. And this way of thinking about globalization is the continuation of thinking that has been around for a long time. Such as, when the Europeans went to the Orient to find spices, which was also an example of global trade and communication. Another way to think of globalization, though, is an economic system. It is a system in which countries become integrated in a way that never had been before. In this system, we see a global split in the process between consuming and producing goods. Some countries produce goods, some countries consume goods, and then these countries in different areas of the globe depend on each other in a kind of organic solidarity rather than having an economic system being just inside your country. The system is the way economy in your country functions depends on economy of another country. And, in fact, this way of thinking about globalization represents a new area of economic progression. The past industrialist economy has been a global issue.
Now, the study of biology is responsible for some of the most profounding insights that humans have about the world around them. So, take a look at these four panoramas. In the upper left, you see some bacteria. This happen to be equaline. You obviously see a butterfly, a flower, a dolphin. If you see that at the outer space, just looks these different forms and structures. You have no idea that they were all related to one to another. So one of the most profound thing that biology told us is that all life on Earth is exceptionally related, similar to one to another. So, for example, all of these life forms rely on DNA and RNA for storing and transmitting and using their genetic and inherited information. They are all based on cell. Cell is the fundamental building blocks of all life. All of these organisms consist of cells, and the cells essentially have the same chemicals inside of them, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, and the whole bunch of other stuff and much smaller amount. All these organisms conducted metabolism, in other words, chemical reactions that using convert energy from one form to another. And the basic chemistry is all very similar to one and another. The types of molecule is used very similar to one and another. And the Why do we need to recycle water? Because we don't generate much new water. Chemically, the process of generating water, which is basically taking hydrogen and oxygen and burning them to produce water, is not a process that happens a lot anymore. So in terms of our total volume of water in the world, yes, it is changing, but it's not changing significantly relative to the rate at which we are using or demand fresh new water. Now there are a lot of different areas of technology involved in water recycling, and we are, later in the interview, going to get to industrial use and the reclamation of sewage. What about in the home at the moment? What sort of technology is being utilized in the home when? We talk about water recycling, while well, very little on average. Typically in a modern home we turn on the tap, we take a glass of water, we probably in turning on that tap flush 10 glasses of water down the sink. We take a shower, we use fresh water, we do a whole range of things, and there is nominally very little recycling of that. It goes down the drain and it goes off to a wastewater treatment plant. There is actually very, very little recycling at a local level. People don't actually say, well, I'm now going to take the water I just used, put it through a sophisticated process and reuse it and have a closed loop. It's not a closed loop in the home. <laughs> 